So welcome to our um, webinar for today, you know, hope, finding hope after loss. So I'm gonna start with a story. And so I'm a mom, I have four children. And so a few years ago, I was driving home on a Friday night in rush hour traffic and I was lost in thought. It was a just a few weeks away from Christmas. And Christmas is really my favorite time of year. I get to spend it with my kids. And Christmas morning is super important because that was our guaranteed time together where I could have all my children together. And I loved all the lights, um, you know, along the highway. And I was looking forward to our time together. But then my thoughts were interrupted when my phone rang. It was my oldest daughter. And rather than hearing her say her usual hello, she said to somebody else in the room, I know he hasn't been feeling well lately. And I immediately knew she was talking about her brother, my son, because they worked at car dealerships next to each other and were frequently found in one another's showroom helping each other. And so I yelled out to her, Brittany, 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 but she didn't answer. So I hung up the phone and called her back and she answered and I could tell that something was wrong. And what she said to me was, I don't know how to tell you this mom. This is the hardest thing I will ever tell you. But Connor is dead. He killed himself. So by this time, I pulled over the side of the highway. My gut instinct had told me things were wrong. And so I hit the steering wheel. I was asking God, it's like, how could this be happening and why? Because it took me to a flashback of 28 years earlier when I lost my first child. And all I can think about is that I needed to be with my son and I needed to be with my daughter. So all I did was I turned my car around and my nightmare was being relived because I wasn't prepared for this. In between the first loss and my second loss, I also experienced other family deaths. However, what I discovered is that the things that I designed to help to heal from my first loss helped me with the others that followed. And I never knew how being a working mom working as a health coach, personal trainer, and nutritionist would help me in life's challenges. So my name is Peggy Green. I'm an author. I've written Life After Child Loss, The Mother Survival Guide to Cope and Find Joy. I'm a speaker and a grief coach. And I'm often asked, how have I gotten through all this loss? Because I have to step back and really acknowledge that loss. How have I managed to survive? So I know from the beginning that I chose to be an active participant in my healing. I knew I could not let my loss define me. Rather, I was going to let it refine me. And it has shaped me into who I am today. And so as a result, I believe that what mothers who have lost a child want and need the most is hope. So in our time together, I'm going to share the four cornerstones of healing, along with how my research on grief has helped me through the loss of my son and my other losses. And more importantly here, you will leave with practical and applicable tips you can use in your pursuit of hope and helping you move through your grief. And I know these strategies work, and what I do is teach you how to think, act, and move to navigate tough times. So let's get started with the corner, first cornerstone of healing, which is your physical health. And so physical health is often forgotten when it comes to healing. However, it's the foundation of easing complications and healing grief. You know, signs and symptoms of poor health, and you may be experiencing some of this is, you know, migraines, insomnia, insomnia, pain, inflammation, colds, flus, you know, and more just general fatigue and lack of desire to move forward. And there's multiple modalities to improve physical health. 
and I could speak on that for hours. However, today I'm just going to focus on a little bit about nutrition and exercise because I know that those are so foundational and helping. I believe that that's the place what we really need to start in our physical healing. So, and how that comes to play is, so the day of my son's funeral, he passed away in December and we know that Colorado weather can be a little wonky. I mean, it could be having a snowstorm in December or we could have a warm sunshiny day. Well, the day of his funeral, it happened to be a warm sunshiny day. And when I got up with that sunrise, I went for a run. And I knew that I needed to be able to clear my head to help reduce my stress. It gave me control of the moment and it gave me control of what, as much as I could of what was going to come for the day. It gave me some peace. And so I, I exercise on a regular basis and know the positive effect it has on depression and anxiety, those things that come with grief. It can reduce your stress, improve your memory, help sleep better, and boost overall mood. And it can increase and improve your ability to focus and offer that sense of control. And the really cool thing about this is that you do not have to be a fitness fanatic to reap the benefits. And so people ask, like, where do I start? And I say, most people start with walking if you weren't already exercising. And it's recommended to get like 10,000 steps per day. So Brenda, who started working with me after her son passed away, could not believe I was recommending she get off the couch and out of the house. She felt like I was trying to force her into something she did not want to do. I suggested she started by setting a goal of even just walking around the block and making that part of her morning routine. I didn't twist her arm, but she thought about it and decided to commit for one week. For that week then, she logged her activity every day and noted how she felt after she walked. And when we met together for her coaching session the following week, she admitted walking improved her mood and she had more energy. So as you see, exercise is physical, um, is critical in physical health and helping you in your grief. So nutrition is another important component of physical health. And I want to share today a little bit about what healthy eating looks like. And this is a simple framework for good nutritional habits. And the thing is, is that it is easy to go to want to eat the convenient food, the comfort foods, because they will comfort you short term, momentarily, but in the long term, they have such a negative impact on it. So I wanted to share a little bit what that framework for good eating looks like. And so there's eight components to it. And so I like to say that you will add more real food, eat juice plus, plant powdered fruits and vegetables, drink more water, eliminate gluten and dairy, and finally reduce caffeine, alcohol, and sugar. So I come from that personal training background, bringing in incorporating the exercise, but also the nutrition. So I really suggest that we think about this as a whole. Now I do want to add, while there's no right or wrong way to grieve, there are healthy ways to cope with pain. So when it comes to that framework is that you want to eat more fruits and vegetables, nine to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables. And sometimes that's really hard to get. And we want to go to that easy junk food. But overall, it gives you the nutrition that your body needs to give you increased energy and keep you from getting sick and also helps with the mental component of it as well. And sometimes that's hard to do. So for me, I also doubled up on the juice plus that I was taking. It's fruits and vegetables in a capsule and it's all powdered. So it's actually what you would put on your plate, but then it's been simply dehydrated. And I did that. I've been taking it already, but the day after my son passed away, I doubled up on my juice plus because I know the impact stress and anxiety has on our physical health. As a matter of fact, I honestly believe that the cancer that surfaced for both my mom 
uh, my sister and my father actually was a result of stressful life events and their cancer surfaced shortly thereafter. Needless to say, losing another child is very stressful. And I have two other children whom I need to be living for, two other beautiful girls and grandchildren and a niece. So it was really important and that was simple. Even if I can't eat everything I'm supposed to do. And then drinking more water. Um, this helps to keep our body hydrated. It helps with the grief brain and brain fog and helps to keep the digestion going. So it's recommended to eat, drink, one half your body weight in ounces of water. So a simple example of that is if you weigh 140 pounds, then you divide that by two, and then 70 ounces of water is what you need to be drinking. And that's water, not coffee, tea, sodas, but 70 ounces of water. And then on top of, it, on top of that, we wanna eliminate gluten and dairy because those are inflammatories and they can cause additional inflammation, just like grief makes inflammation. And when you add more gluten and dairy, that adds to it. So gluten is a product that really doesn't serve us at all. The root word is glue, and I don't want to be eating glue. So you're better off taking that out of your um, diet and really focusing on the whole foods. And then you want to reduce caffeine, alcohol, and sugar. Caffeine is a stimulant. So if you're already feeling anxious and anxiety, when we amp ourselves up with caffeine, that contributes to it. And then that can add more anxiety and just spiral upward. Now I must say that some people can't give up their coffee and that's okay, but just have one cup. Reduce what you're doing with that. And the same thing with alcohol. Alcohol is a depressant and it may help you to sleep temporarily, but that is also a dehydration. We talked about getting water, so we want to make sure that we're not using alcohol and suppressing our feelings and emotions. Because one of the things that we really need to do is feel those. Because when we stuff those feelings and emotions, then we don't give ourselves the opportunity to heal. And then sugar is another big one, and it's hidden in so many things. It's hidden in like all those comfort foods and you get the highs and the lows and that impacts your health and impacts your physical health and your mental health as well. So when you're thinking about this, it all comes together. You're drinking more water, you're not drinking sodas and sodas have a lot of water. So when you focus on this whole big framework of nutrition, then that can really give you a heads up in helping you to heal. So I've given you now what I have about physical health with exercise and nutrition. And so in the next part of our presentation, I want to share you, with you the second cornerstone, which is emotional health. And so I really like to bring this up with people who are emotionally healthy, are in control of their thoughts and feelings, behaviors. You're able to cope with life's challenges. Now, where you are with your grief, it's okay because you're in this temporary, temporarily, but not in the long term where you feel that you don't have that ability to bounce back. Um, you can ultimately feel good about yourselves and have good relationships. So poor emotional health, and I like to put this in here so that you can assess and evaluate where you're sitting, kind of like in that long term. So long-term anger and um, aggression or hostility, if that is every day, continually, or if you have it some, and then you can feel positive, you know, in can be able to compare that. Or long-term withdrawal from friends and family is that you feel like you can't face anybody, that you can't go back to work. And then even the ideation of wanting to join your loved one, no matter how they died. This frequently happens when somebody loses a loved one to suicide because they're like, hey, if they took their life, then I'm going to do it too because they're in a better place. So that just gives you a little bit of a com um, comparison in how you can assess how you're doing. So I love working with grieving moms. And just last week, I was working with Carol who lost 
her child just four months ago. And she was explaining how guilty she felt because her child took her life and that she could never ever release herself of the guilt or forgive herself. And she had a lot of anxiety and wasn't sleeping as a result of it. So we worked together and I <clears throat> wanted to share with her something I call the four C's and because she felt so guilty. And it's, you cannot control others. You cannot cure others' problems and you did not cause them what to do what they did. And number four in the case of suicide is that they made that choice. She wanted to take responsibility, even though her daughter was an older adult. And I told her she did not have that superpower to make that choice and, and control her. And she wanted to really think that she was a mind reader and knew everything about her daughter, but she didn't. She felt that she failed her and she expected to be a fortune teller and predict the future. And I revoked that superpower is that she could not predict it. And finally, when she was able to process this, she realized she did not control, cure, or cause what her daughter did. And so she's able to give that responsibility to her daughter and then start taking responsibility for herself. So we met on a webinar similar to this, and it was called Three Tips to Move Through Child Loss Grief. And I'm so grateful that we did. So addressing those emotions, the three C's is a great way to do it. I also like to talk about shifting your mindset to your circumstances. So you might be telling yourself, you don't know how to overcome your loss. You don't know that you deserve happiness. You're responsible for your child's passing. You cannot live without them now or ever. This might be you. You may be thinking you may never be the same. Now you can't control some of these emotions of anger and guilt, and, but you can change your responses. So changing that mindset is one of the most beneficial things that you can do to help deal with your emotions. It's also one of the hardest, just like we talked about the three C's. So I'm gonna get geeky here for just a moment and just say that there are neural pathways that develop in your brain that allow your thoughts to repeat over and over and over and over. And it's like a worn path in the field. Like when I was growing up, my best friend lived in the house across the field and we wore a path as we walked that every day. I could literally walk that path in the dark with my eyes closed because it was so well worn. Now the same thing happens with what we think. When we continue to tell ourselves that we're sad, when we continue to tell ourselves that we won't get over it. So it makes it difficult to change, but you can do it. You can rewire and rewrite those thoughts in your head. And the way I found that has been the most beneficial is to do it through affirmations. So your brain is extremely good at protecting your, yourself from pain. It wants to go, no, no pain. But as I mentioned, we need to feel that and experience it because that helps us to heal. I think sometimes we have a tendency to forget that this is part of the circle of life, that death does come with the privilege of living. Now, it's not always on our time. It's not always when we want it, and it's unexpected but to be able to say this is part of that circle of life. You can, ex you can control your responses though. So you do it with affirmations. So affirmations are positive statements that help you to challenge yourself and help you overcome creating and repeating negative thoughts. And when you start to implement positive thoughts, it replaces those negative ones. So I have eight to 10 affirmations that I do every single day and I do them in the morning and before I go to bed at night. And I tell you, it gives my mindset positivity that is running in the background all day long. 
And then before I go to bed at night, because the last thing that we listen to or see is what our subconscious processes throughout the night. So it's beneficial to be planting positive seeds in your brain. So my favorite affirmation is, I am a great mother and always will be. I tell you, I light up when I feel that because I know that I have four children and I love all four of my children. I'm happy. I'm an amazing mother. I'm good at what I do. And when I relate these positive emotions to that affirmation, it helps that affirmation become much more believable, plausible, and resulting in actually believing them. So we're changing that neural pathway. And so if you're experiencing loss and or anxiety or grief, here are a few that you can include in your affirmation deck. And don't worry about writing them down. Um, I can send this out to you. But it's like, I'm stronger than I think. Just think about that. Yeah, I'm stronger. I've made it through grief and I will survive again. I am in control of me. I can't control the other emotions or the people around me, but I can control me. I am enough. I have survived and I will do it again. So affirmations really need to be written very specifically because if they're written incorrectly, they can do more harm than good. And so it's a really good idea to work with somebody who's been effective in writing affirmations. So now this wraps up the second cornerstone of healing, which is emotional health. And so now we'll talk about that third cornerstone about mental health. And now again, allow me to offer what good mental health looks like and what poor mental health looks like because I think it's so critical that you be able to evaluate where you are. So one of my clients, Eileen, asked me when we were in a coaching session, sir, examples of positive mental health. And I shared five signs of it. And one is you feel good about yourself. And two, you do not long-term become overwhelmed by emotions such as fear, anger, guilt, or anxiety. You have lasting and personal relationships that are satisfying, or you feel comfortable with other people in new situations. You're open to learning. And number five, you can laugh at yourself, finding humor in your daily life. Now here's the opposite here of poor mental health is mental illnesses and disorders that affect your mood, thinking, and behavior. One is like depression, two is schizophrenia, three is anxiety disorder, four is um, eating disorders, and five is addictive behavior. So if you're experiencing those, then I suggest that you reach out to a mental health provider because these are not normal parts of grief. So when you're experiencing those, you have transitioned a little bit more into a long-term, more of a complicated grief. So I wanted to share with you a little bit more then is that we want to be able to laugh. And this is so good. We've heard that laughter is the best medicine. And I do want to say that it's true. I've been recently listening to um, a stand-up comedian and where she laughs at the circumstances in her life. She finds humor in things like going into an elevator or the clothing that she wears or, you know, the fact that um, somebody was so dedicated to what she did. And she tells the stories in such a way that they're not hurtful, but finding humor. So it produces endorphins laughter. It gives us feel-good endorphins, which really elevates our mood and can change things. So what I would like you to do is to think about laughter. Where can you find it? Can you find something, even if you watch it on TV, for the next 30 days? I would say just for the next 30 days, you know, sit down before you start this challenge. Go, okay, where do I feel like I am on my mental health? On a scale of one to 10. One is that I am just totally in this dark, dark place. And 10, I feel wonderful. 
I'm going to assume that because you've recently experienced loss is that you're somewhere in between. And what I'd like to do is you just write that down and then pick something that you're going to focus on being able to laugh. And if it's watching comedies, you know, um, reading funny books, you know, whatever it may be. And be honest and then do that for 30 days. And at the end of those 30 days, using the same base, are you happy? Can you move? Can you laugh? So evaluate yourself and see how laughter has elevated your health, your mental health. Okay. So I want to share a story with you that comes along with this is that your grief is like a cocoon. And so in the darkness that surrounds you, you just don't know how to get out. You're stuck in this. And you take small steps every day to find joy and happiness and find breakthroughs. And much to your surprise, you look in the mirror one day and discover you don't recognize yourself. Because like the caterpillar that entered the cocoon and finally is broken free by batting their wings and getting stronger and stronger, you are transformed into a butterfly with a newfound appreciation for life. And I hope that you can see yourself as that butterfly that wants to come out of the darkness and experience life with joy, peace, and happiness. It's being intentional. So that's what I have for the third cornerstone with mental health. And now I want to move on to our fourth and final one, which is spiritual health. So just a short definition is spiritual health is a personal matter involving your integrity and your morals and support and compassion that is the mission of your life. And so what is positive examples of spiritual health? Well, spiritual wellness provides us with the systems of faith and beliefs and ethics and principles. And a healthy spiritual practice may include Examples of being able to volunteer and social contributions, belonging to a group, fellowship, optimism, forgiveness, and compassion. Now, you may or may not believe in a God, and that's up to you, but a higher power is a supreme deity or your conception of God. You may not believe them, but it's what you turn to in times of the unexplainable. It helps to give you peace and rest. And I believe, I personally believe in God and will refer to him as such, but I'm not forcing that upon you. You may feel free to insert higher power as I talk about it. So I know that God has given me peace and comfort and joy as I've been traveling this journey. I also know that he's giving the comfort to be able to help others. So I want to share a short message from Connor's funeral, and I feel like it was a message from God, my higher power. So over 300 people attended Connor's funeral, and the pastor who conducted his funeral service shared with me his intuition that many people who were attending his service did not believe in God or that they blamed God that Connor took his life. And actually shared that Connor had God by his side. And God was telling him, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. However, he let Connor and Connor's free will to make that final choice. God could have intervened, but God is the one of free will as well. And so that gave me comfort in knowing that it wasn't God that killed them. So I want to share a little bit about prayer. And so prayer is a solemn request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God or your higher power. It's a wish for hope. And I personally find that praying is an opportunity to talk with God. What, tell him what's on my mind and ask for help. Prayer doesn't have to be complicated and it can be as easy as saying the word, help. Oh, because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, knows what's on your mind and intercedes on your behalf. And prayers, they don't have to be perfect. 
It can be said anywhere, anytime. And there's no judgment. God's not judging you. So there's different types of prayers where you can pour out your grief and say how sad you are. You can ask for comfort and say, God, because of this grief, I really need some help. Give me some healing. Give me some peace. Give me some strength. And you can also prayers of gratitude. So God does not choose the strong, but gives the weak, broken, and the tired strength to lead and make it through. So that wraps up our four cornerstone of spirituality. And that's our final one. So we've moved through these different parts of grief. And I wanted to share that you will get better. There will be shorter peaks and valleys, the duration shorter, and the frequency less intense. So one of the common questions that I get very frequently is, Peggy, is there a way that we can get the same results that you get when you're sharing on stage on a webinar like this? And as a matter of fact, I do have other ways to do this. So recently I was on a grief breakthrough session and a grieving mom told me she had no idea help was available. And that's what I found 30 years ago, that there wasn't help to get me through my first loss. But since then, I've developed the tools and techniques to help and that there is help available. So this woman told me she, she was struggling and wanted to feel normal and be happy again. And so she decided to sign up for my eight week coaching program, to help move towards those goals and those feelings again. And I know that having someone in your corner that you're most likely to be able to recover and heal as you move through this. So I offer a complimentary grief breakthrough session to help you see your own possibilities and give you hope. So in this connection, I give you a time to really share more about your loss and what you're going through. And I give you help and you'll walk away with some more practical tips and tools that are specific to you that you can use to give you that opportunity to see what grief coaching is like. So now you know that I'm a grief coach and seen some of my tools and techniques, I think that it's really important to get help. It's much like an automobile accident. If you're in an automobile accident, you go to the emergency room if you've broken some bones. You don't wait weeks and months or years. You start to get that recovery help from a professional, somebody that can actually help you to move through that pain and heal. So there's three criteria I recommend that you really evaluate when you're looking at somebody to be able to help you. So number one is the person that you're considering have practical experience with what you're going through. And recall, I've experienced child loss twice. And number two, does that person have the passion to be working as a grief coach? And like I said, no mom deserves to do this alone. They really deserve to have somebody walk alongside with them. And number three, have they personally used the tools and techniques which they're offering to you? And so I know that the tools that I share in my grief coaching are 100% responsible for my recovery and being able to stand here and offer the support that I do. And I know deep down that they will work for you. So I want to leave you with this thought here. So I was introduced to a personal development coach who helped me become clear on my life's purpose. And I really want to share that with you because it's so important to know how much of an impact working with a coach and with a mentor has done for me. So my purpose is to be joyful, grateful, present, encouraging, positive, and be the best possible version of myself and my personal relationships and my professional re relationships. I want to exemplify Christ in all that I do and show that I am life's possibilities. Be that example. So it was pivotal for me in having a coach to support me. 
and being able to realize my own potential, my own purpose. And sometimes we can all get stuck and it takes a mentor or coach to help us move through that and navigate it. I wanna let you know that I can be that coach for you. What I do know is that your life will never be the same as before losing your loved one. I also know that you can have hope to learn to live life without them. So that wraps up our session for today.